Okay, you have to promise me one thing. Don't contact me again about this. Consider it on my radar. I haven't been messaged about anything more over the last year or so, and I can see why. This topic goes against the current dogma. Is blood cholesterol really a heart disease risk? Maybe not. We're going to be talking about a group of people that have been dubbed the lean mass hyper responders. These people experience very high cholesterol levels, specifically cholesterol containing low density lipoproteins, henceforth named LDL. And we've thought for a very long time that LDL is not only associated, but likely causative to heart disease. However, a team of people, including Mr. Dave Feldman, have been pointing the finger at an exception in the data. And that exception is people who fit this profile of lean mass hyper responder. So let's critically analyze what Mr. Feldman puts forth. As background, Mr. Feldman is a software engineer and an entrepreneur, but what I really like about him is that he took it upon himself to run a study using crowdfunding to get an answer to a puzzling situation that he faced. That takes some serious dedication, and I love the idea of the public directly funding a study. Anyway, the issue, as you can imagine, was the increased LDL in the blood. More specifically, it popped up when consuming a low-carbohydrate diet. Yet, this happens when a person is quite fit, at least not over fat. So, is the LDL still a concern in relation to heart disease? Well, in an interview between Mr. Feldman and one of the researchers, Dr. Matthew Budoff, on their joint study, the crowdfunded one, Mr. Feldman discusses the preliminary baseline data collected from these individuals who are lean, yet experienced a high blood LDL level on a ketogenic diet. Let's listen in. We were discussing a study yet to happen. Now it's happening, right? Yeah, we are more than halfway enrolled, uh, we're moving along very well. So I think you'll agree with me on some caveats. While this data is very exciting, one, it is preliminary. And two, of course, we'd want everyone to continue working with their doctor. Absolutely, yeah. We never want to try to supplant anyone's health care needs. I, I've answered some questions for people, but, but definitely they need to maintain their, their normal health and their normal relationships with their physician. Now, of course, this was pretty exciting for many reasons. One, the group of people that I was going to bring to you were those who were actually kind of going the opposite way of the guidelines. The ketogenic diet is well known for being rich in saturated fat, commonly lots of high animal protein and red meat and often very low fiber. So before we go into the data, if I told you that these were the folks we'd be looking at on top of having LDL cholesterol in the very top percent of the U.S. population, would you guess they'd probably be high risk? Yeah, I would think for all of those reasons you stated that they would be uh, increased cardiac risk. So let's go ahead and talk about the top line aggregates because it's pretty interesting. 64 participants, average age is 53 years. Um, two-thirds of which are 50 and older. 66% male, so that's another checkbox in the risk side of the equation. Uh, mean LDL cholesterol before the diet was 135, which is just a little above the mean of the average for the population, but the mean average now in this group is 233, which isn't just in the top 1%, I checked, and per NHANES, it's in the top 10% of the top 1%, so the very highest of LDL. These people, pre-ketogenic diet, very low carbohydrate diet, had blood LDL levels 100 points lower than where they ended up after switching over to a ketogenic diet, just to be clear. Okay, in a bit, we'll get some information on how their heart health looks. But first, we need to know how long that they've been on a ketogenic diet because being keto for two weeks, even with a 100-point increase in LDL, isn't going to show up on any atherosclerosis test. Atherosclerosis being the plaque buildup in the artery. This is probably one of the most fascinating bits is that even their eligibility was supposed to be two years or longer, our average for this group is around four years. So that's, that's quite a cohort that we have here. 
Okay, so a little over four years on a ketogenic diet, and the assumption is that their LDL was elevated that entire time. In spite of this, and this is probably the most relevant, two thirds of this cohort have calcification of zero and no total plaque score. What does that mean? Well, so uh, despite four years of, uh, on average, of LDLs that are in, as you said, in the top 0.1%, uh, in the U.S., uh, they have not yet developed any atherosclerosis uh, in their coronary arteries as best as we can detect. And there's nothing right now more sensitive non-invasively than a, than a coronary calcium scan plus a CT angiogram combination, which is what we're using in this study. Wow, what a revelation. So even after four years, most of these people do not have a progression of atherosclerosis as measured by a calcium score, which is a metric of more advanced plaque formation generally, as well as total plaque score, which measures the plaque formation that isn't necessarily calcified. Initially, my critique was going to be that the CAC score, the coronary artery score, that they mentioned is sometimes incorrectly assumed to be enough to determine cardiovascular disease risk. There's a good evidence that some people do not develop calcium, yet do develop plaque. So it is important not to assume that if there is a CAC score of zero, that all risk is eliminated. Risk can still persist as a soft plaque, which can be even more dangerous. But to their credit, they shut me up nicely by including a secondary measure that presumably addresses this issue. I love it. So even by baseline data, that's pretty fascinating because that means that these people who for years have had high LDL, presumably, do not have major atherosclerosis development. And in a conference, Mr. Feldman offered a few more details on the study itself. And we reached full recruitment on this wonderful day a few weeks ago, February 8th, where we had all 100 participants completing their first scan. Now you have to understand, this has been at the center of my life. So I absolutely had like, you know, cut and paste timelines in my brain. And right away, I'm like, finally, the clock has started. Because I knew all along, and I was telling all of you, whenever people would ask me, when's the study going to be complete? When's the study going to be done? I said, look, whenever the last person gets scanned, it's going to be a year from now, right? So now I know, February 8th, roughly, in 2024, all 100 participants will have completed their second visit scan. So the sample size or the number of participants is larger here, and they will get the final results in February of 2024. But if I'm honest, which I try to be 60% of the time, I don't think that the results are going to matter much. If you haven't seen atherosclerosis after four years, it seems unlikely that suddenly 80% or something to that effect will suddenly develop atherosclerosis in one year. So I would guess that there won't be a huge difference. Okay, let's assume there isn't much of a difference. What do we make of all this? Well, Mr. Feldman and colleagues have offered some explanations, which they call the lipid energy model. Essentially, it states that people, uh, people who are lean that switch to a high fat diet may experience a dramatic spike in blood LDL, sometimes hundreds of points upwards because the high fat content in their nutrition leads to more triglycerides, those are fat molecules being delivered to the liver by the intestines. These triglycerides are repackaged into VLDL particles. Those are very low density lipoproteins. And these triglycerides are then massively taken up by the tissues of the body, keeping LDL levels high. Yet triglyceride levels low because these triglycerides are being delivered to the tissues, but the LDL remains in circulation. They also mention that when VLDLs deliver triglycerides to the tissues, they reduce in size to form LDL, but they also produce HDL or high density lipoproteins. It is also known that the intestines can generate their own HDL, adding to the blood HDL pool. This would explain why lean mass hyperresponders have low triglycerides, high LDL, and high HDL. All of this culminates in an interpretation that people who are lean have low triglycerides, high LDL, and high HDL are lipid functional, meaning that their body is adjusting and adapting to the mass intake of nutrient fat in their diet in a healthy way, 
unlike someone who's obese, for example, who would have a lipid dysfunction. Their body is burdened into making adaptations which lead to heart disease. All of this is extremely interesting to me, and I appreciate the compelling physiological explanations of this paper. I also appreciate the data that has come out so far. However, I do find it comical when people will often default, and I quote, epidemiology or association isn't science, yet are now hanging on every word of this study, which is association. Look, I think this study is informative, and I value Mr. Feldman's efforts tremendously. I've even donated to his cause to fund further study, because I want answers, not some stick-to-the-status-quo non-thinker, aka not a science-minded person. But as a thinker and a qualified one, it's also important to point out several areas that need to be addressed. One, the study does not have a control group. Two, it is not a randomized controlled trial. Three, I love the use of the total plaque score, but there is a significant criticism of the CAC score after only one year's time, especially in people with a CAC score of zero at baseline, which is the majority of the study participants. These researchers argue that at least five years has to elapse before a second scan should be done. And since we don't know how rigorously people have been consuming the ketogenic diet the last four years, it leaves some questions on the follow through with the diet over time before the study began. Four, no one has ever claimed that LDL is the only risk factor for heart disease. I'm not saying Mr. Feldman believes this, to be clear, but many people make this straw man argument. LDL is a risk factor, but not the only one. I've said this over and over again. It is entirely true that if other metrics of health are well controlled, like being lean, like having normal blood pressure, etc., this reduces heart disease risk significantly, even if not completely. Additionally, ApoB is a better marker than LDL, even if LDL makes up a large part of ApoB. Five, there is a giant pile of research indicating associations and causations between LDL and heart disease risk. This research has also accounted for many other risk factors, including metabolic dysfunction like diabetes. And some of the research was independently funded with no industry or pharmaceutical link. Finally, allow me to acknowledge that Mr. Feldman and colleagues are in the process of doing a study with a control group, which I look forward to analyzing. Bottom line is, is it possible that the lipoprotein risk factor may need some nuances applied to it? Yes, it's entirely possible that Feldman and colleagues are onto something, and that something is that certain people may be at low risk of heart disease, even with elevated LDL. However, there are entirely too many questions to be answered, too much data that firmly points towards lipoproteins being a heart disease risk. And I expect to keep the possibility open that a small group of people are the exception to the rule. But for the vast majority of people, it would likely be prudent to follow the preponderance of the evidence and keep trying to keep ApoB levels in check. I will, of course, be covering more on this topic in the future with an open mind, but with mountains of data to be explained. Here at Physionic, we integrate, not ignore. Thanks for watching. Speak with you in the next one.